major development anti-vaxxer truckers of Canada brought the capital city of Ottawa to a standstill. Thousands of demonstrators from across the country joined the so-called Freedom Convoy protesting against vaccine mandates of the country. What followed drew major criticism. However, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's stand on mandatory vaccination for truckers crossing the US-Canada border remains unchanged. Here's a ground report on what really transpired. Trucks rolled into Canada's capital, Ottawa, on January 29th to stage a massive protest against Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's COVID-19 vaccine mandates in front of Parliament on a frigid winter day. The so-called Freedom Convoy, coming from East and West, started out as a rally against a vaccine requirement for cross-border truckers but had turned into a demonstration against government overreach during the pandemic with a strong anti-vaccination streak. I'm not vaccinated. So I left before the 15th of January. The rule in the States wasn't in place yet, but I, I have other friends that say even no vaccinated now, right now, the U.S. Customs, they're not enforcing that. So they're still going there. The problem is when we come back. But nobody anticipated what happened in the following days. Thousands of truckers descended upon Parliament Hill with the non-stop blaring of truck horns. Meanwhile, the demonstrations had become a security scare for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who was moved to an undisclosed location. But the Canadian Premier's resolve wasn't shaken. I want to be very clear. We are not intimidated by those who hurl insults and abuse at small business workers and steal food from the homeless. We won't give in to those who fly racist flags. We won't cave to those who engage in vandalism or dishonor the memory of our veterans. Canada imposed a vaccine mandate for the trucking industry from January 15th, under which unvaccinated Canadian truckers re-entering Canada from the United States must get tested for coronavirus and quarantine themselves. But many are deriving political mileage out of the crisis too. Senior members of the official opposition Conservative Party, which last year lost its third consecutive election to Trudeau's Liberals, have praised the demonstrators. Politicians exploiting people's fears, I ask you to think long and hard about the consequences of your actions. The Canadian Trucking Alliance, which represents some 4,500 carries, opposes the protest. About 90% of Canada's cross-border truckers and 77% of the population has had two shots. It seems that government, the government of Canada, Justin Trudeau, doesn't want to succumb to the pressure under these truckers. Let's see what happens on the weekend. I'm Vishal Seni with cameraman Sumit Singh from India today at Crown Zero, Ottawa, Canada. Tensions between Ukraine and Russia have reached fever pitch. Additional troops are being sent by NATO to Eastern Europe and Moscow is preparing herself for any eventuality by sending additional 30,000 combat troops as well as weapons to Belarus over the last few days. But panic among people in border areas is something that is of major concern for the international community. I can't say that I am... Uh, Tensions between Russia and the United States over Moscow's troop build-up near Ukraine spilled into the United Nations Security Council on Monday, when diplomats for both countries fiercely outlined their positions. The threats of aggression on the border of Ukraine, yes, on its border, is provocative. 
our recognition of the facts on the ground is not provocative. The threats of action if Russia's uh, security demands aren't met is provocative. Our encouraging diplomacy is not provocative. The provocations from Russia, not from us or other members of this council. Our Western colleagues are talking about the need for de-escalation. However, first and foremost, they themselves are whipping up tensions and rhetoric and are provoking escalation. The discussions about a threat of war is provocative in and of itself. You are almost calling for this. You are waiting for it to happen, as if you want to make your words become a reality. Troop mobilization, high-level visits, aggressive posturing by both sides. The week led to frayed nerves and increased tensions between the West, Ukraine and Russia. Ukrainians who had been in the direct line of any such incursion have started preparing themselves. <laughs> Civilians are preparing for the worst possible scenario, signing up with the Territorial Defense Force to brush up their skills. City schools are practicing bomb scare or air raid drills. Social media is full of official guides to prepare for emergency evacuation and people have begun plotting their escape route, which mostly involves driving west as fast as they can. Ukraine doesn't want war. Ukrainian people don't want war. That's why diplomats are putting maximum effort to de-escalate the situation and force Russia to de-escalate the situation and remain on a diplomatic track. Obviously, if Russia starts the military escalation, we will fight and the whole country will defend itself. But for the time being, there are all chances for diplomacy to achieve success. The cost of a conflict would be massive. According to the Norwegian Refugee Council, up to 2 million people living on both sides of the contact line in eastern Ukraine will be under increased threat of violence and displacement if the conflict escalates. New high-resolution satellite imagery illustrates heightened Russian military deployments in Belarus, Crimea and western Russia. While Russian military activities in those areas have been reported for several weeks, recent imagery suggests that the Russian units now have increased troops to support more aggressive operations. New high-resolution satellite imagery provided by US-based space firm Maxar Technologies illustrates heightened Russian military deployments in Belarus, Crimea and western Russia. In the last days, we have seen a significant movement of Russian military forces into Belarus. This is the biggest Russian deployment there since the Cold War. With an expected 30,000 combat troops, Spetsnaz Special Operation Forces, fighter jets, including Su-35, Iskander dual-capable missiles and S-400 air defense systems. The U.S. gave the green light to plans to move more troops to Europe and dispatch soldiers already stationed on the continent further east as it seeks to send a stronger military message alongside its diplomatic efforts with Russia over Ukraine. The United States will soon move additional forces to Romania, Poland, and Germany. I want to be very clear about something. These are not permanent moves. They are moves designed to respond to the current security environment. Moreover, these forces are not going to fight in Ukraine. They are going to ensure the robust defense of our NATO allies. Meanwhile, Germany and Russia have banned each other's national broadcasting stations in their respective countries. The conflict over resources has already begun.
Never has a country seen the kind of boycotts that China is facing as host of the Winter Olympics. While many nations decided to declare early on boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympics, which means that top diplomats and representatives of the countries will not attend the opening and the closing ceremonies of the event because of China's human rights records, India was the latest to join the boycott not so much because of the human rights record, but because Beijing has put forth, projected one of the soldiers who fought in the Galwan clashes between India and China as an Olympic torchbearer. The Winter Olympics Games in Beijing 2022, which started from February 4th and will go on till the 20th, has seen around 91 delegations joining the competition in China as compared to 206 that had travelled to Japan for the Summer Olympics. The US, UK and Canada declared a diplomatic boycott along with India, Australia, Lithuania, Kosovo, Belgium, Denmark and Estonia. They have sent athletes, but no ministers or officials are attending. New Zealand, Austria, Slovenia, Sweden and the Netherlands are not sending government representatives, but say COVID is their reason. France has been against a boycott. President Macron said that the games should not be politicized. On the other hand, there are leaders from major countries who were present at the opening ceremony to show their support to China. Russian President Vladimir Putin and Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan topped that list. Argentina and Ecuador also included. Egypt's President Abdel Fateh al-Sisi and Serbia's Alexander Vucic have gravitated towards China amid growing frictions with the West. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE were also present. China is Saudi Arabia's largest buyer of oil and a significant customer of Qatar's natural gas. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, the leaders of all five former Soviet republics in Central Asia, were present in Beijing. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres and the WHO Director General also attended the opening ceremony. Welcome back to World Today. Now, Mali's transitional government has asked the French ambassador to Mali to leave the country. This comes after French Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian's remarks that the military government of the country is out of control and illegitimate. Here's a report. Mali's military leaders have decided to expel the French ambassador, Joel Mayer, over the controversial remarks made against his transitional government by French Foreign Minister Jean-Élie Drian. The French Foreign Minister's comments caused furor among the top leadership of Mali's transitional government, generating a sharp reaction from the country's military leaders. According to a statement issued on Mali's national television, the French ambassador has been given 72 hours to leave the country. France has issued a statement saying it was recalling Joel Mayer. Earlier in the week, the French Foreign Minister, Jean-Yves Le Drian, had lashed out at the Malian transition government in his meeting with the Nigerian counterpart, Hasumi Masoudou. I would like to say very strongly that this junta is illegitimate and that it takes irresponsible measures. With 15 other European partners, we have yesterday expressed our solidarity with Denmark, whose contribution to the fight against terrorism is essential. The junta, regardless of its commitments, bears the responsibility of the withdrawal of Danish forces and isolates itself further from its international partners. Since 2013, France has been supporting the West African landlocked nation in its fight against Islamist militants who were advancing on its capital city, Bamako. Relations between the two nations took a turn for the worse when the junta that seized power in 2020 went back on its promise to organize elections in February 2022. The military government now intends to stay in power until 2025. The latest dispute now raises questions on whether French troops will now be asked to withdraw from the country. Earlier in the week, Mali had asked Denmark to withdraw its troops from the country. Western powers are also concerned about Russia's growing involvement in the former French colony. Days after the coup, military junta of Burkina Faso has restored the country's constitution and appointed an interim president. Here are the details. 
Days after the African Union suspended Burkina Faso from the AU bloc, the military junta has announced that it has restored the constitution and appointed Paul Henry Sandago, Damiba as interim president. Earlier, Burkina Faso soldiers stated on state television that they had seized control and dissolved the country's government and parliament. Communique numéro un. Peuple du Burkina Faso. People of Burkina Faso, given the continued degradation of the security situation that is threatening the very foundation of our nation, the manifest incapacity of the government of Mark Roche-Gabor to unify the Burkina Bay to effectively tackle the situation, and given the exasperation of the different sections of the nation, MPSR has decided to take its responsibilities before history. This movement, which includes all sections of the army and security, has decided to end the post of President Kabor this January 24, 2022. The people of Burkina Faso had hoped that the coup would ease the devastation they have endured since jihadist violence spread across the country. Meanwhile, the international community has condemned the overthrowing of a democratically elected government. Secretary General is following developments in Burkina Faso with deep concern. He's particularly worried about the whereabouts and safety of President Rockmark Christian Cabore, as well as the worsening security situation following the coup carried out on January 23rd by sections of the armed forces. The Secretary General strongly condemns any attempted takeover of government by the force of arms. He calls on the coup leaders to lay down their arms and to ensure the protection of the physical integrity of the president and of the institutions of Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso's rural north and east have been badly hit by Islamist violence. Attacks on civilians and the armed forces, including the killing of 49 men at a security post in November, prompted violent protest, calling for Kabore's outstar. He replaced the prime minister and military chiefs, but some critics say that is not enough. While the president is safe but out of power, four coups in the last 18 months in Mali, Guinea, Chad and now Burkina Faso have raised alarm bells for a region that could soon be dubbed the coup belt. And here are some other stories from across the world and world at a glance. Old Manchester United striker Mason Greenwood has been arrested on the suspicion of sexual assault and threat to kill by his girlfriend Harriet Robson. Harriet posted a series of pictures and videos showing the bruises on her body with a caption stating to everyone who wants to know what Mason Greenwood actually does to me. A landslide in Ecuadorian capital Quito has left several people dead and many missing. Mud and rocks were carried down the slopes of the nearby Kishinsha volcano. A recreation ground and eight houses were engulfed and cars swept away. Guinea-Bissau President Omaro said five-hour attack on the government palace was a failed attack against democracy. He survived an attempted coup after assailants armed with machine guns and AK-47s attacked the government palace for hours while the President and Prime Minister were inside. Seven-time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady officially announced his retirement from the NFL. In a goodbye announcement posted on his social media, Tom Brady wrote, I have loved my NFL career and now it is time to focus my time and energy on other things that require my attention. That's all in this edition of World Today. Thank you for watching. News and updates do continue on the other side. Stay tuned to India Today.